screen share works. So my name is Jean-Christophe Bart. I have co-founded the World Association of PPP Units and Professionals, a global network for better public-private partnerships in 2018. Environment, social, governance, ESG investments in PPPs are of great importance. Today's webinar aims at looking at ways to increase the ESG impact in PPP investments. Our great panelists have given me permission to encourage you to ask anything related to the topic, and I encourage our audience to use the Q&A box to interact with the speakers and guide us in the conversation because we want it to be dynamic and really uh, useful for everybody who listens in. We have many people listening in. This is why uh, we can only interact through the Q&A box, but please make uh, use of it. The SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has caused unprecedented damage to economies worldwide. Our trading systems have been massively disrupted. The healthcare investments in medical facilities and equipment due to the pandemic will uh, be huge. Some estimates say it's going to cost 650 billion US dollar uh, to have the appropriate level of uh, healthcare infrastructure. Meeting demand in worldwide telecommunication and IT would require another 210 billion of investment. Meeting demand, uh, uh, the massive impact will result that will result from robotics and artificial intelligence based manufacturing uh, in order to uh, be able to grasp that. We will have to do massive reskilling of our workforce, our food production and distribution will have to be reconfigured to become more resilient. Transportation, ports, airports, everything that has been severely hit uh, through the pandemic uh, will also be up for uh, modernization or enlargement. Our power and water supplies, sanitation that are essential for services, I mean, we can see that the, the tourism industry, everything that is entertainment, we have been severely impacted and some speak of estimates of up to 320 million jobs that could be lost due to the pandemic. Governments are struggling to adapt in the face of limited financial cap cap capacities to provide essential services. Massive investments are necessary to adapt to the new normal and people first public private partnerships can be part of the solution to solve the enormous issues fade, uh, facing economies worldwide because business as usual has proven not to be able to uh, answer to the current uh, challenges. To meet these extraordinary challenges, more responsible ESG investments in infrastructure PPPs are necessary. For infrastructure to serve a positive purpose, risks must be managed and societal, environmental, and economic benefits enhanced because they underpin human and economic development. Both public and private need to learn from each other with regard to the inclusion of the social impact investment dimension at the mega PPP level so that the beneficiaries of the infrastructure reap the benefits and achieve the 2030 agenda to de-risk projects. I have the immense pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Raymond Zana, is titular professor at Basel University and co-founder of CSEND, the Socio-Economic Development Organization, a Geneva-based NGO research and development organization founded in 1993 with ECOSOC special consultative status accreditation. Raymond is a member of the PPP Bureau of the UNECE and has been a member of expert groups on sust global sustainable um, uh, development goals at the United Nations since 2013. He teaches at various academic institutions and has published extensively. His topic in today's presentation is aligning PPPs with responsible business conduct and the SDG strengthen an investor. Here we go, sorry. Uh, the strengthen the investor's reputational capital. Allow me to just make one, uh, one, uh, pre uh, one precision. The webinar is being recorded and we will make this video available afterwards on the YouTube channel of WAP and on the website. This is it, let's start. Raymond, you have the floor. Raymond, can you hear us? Sorry, I had to unmute. 
Thanks. So, uh, Jean-Christophe, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, dear co-panelists and dear viewers, it's a pleasure to be with you and to spend some time on a very important topic. Um, being mindful of time, I'd like just to make a few points to present the larger context of our webinar. And uh, since we are talking about, at the same time, about SDGs, about PPPs, uh, and, and at the same time, of course, mostly ESGs, it's a lot of topics to put into one basket, but they're le linked and related, and I will explain that shortly. First of all, let me start about uh, reminding us uh, that there is the SDGs. We have uh, figures from UNCTAD going back to the World Investment for, uh, Report 2014, which talked about the need to help developing countries implement the SDGs, and at that time there was a gap signaled of 2.5 trillion US dollars. That was then in 2014. Now, as Jean-Christophe already mentioned, of course, we have COVID-19. Donors have been hit. Everybody has been hit. Uh, there's less economic growth, higher debt. Um, the uh, supply chains have been broken to some extent, and there's reduced trade. So there's less money easily available. However, you will see with the following slides, there is money around that we could fruitfully invest in what we consider to be an important investment that's ESG related investment. Next. So let's uh, look at what kind of infrastructure investments could be undertaken, should be undertaken. We have the physical infrastructure, sort of the traditional infrastructure uh, investment in energy, transportation, telecom, and water. Then also social infrastructure related health, education, social services. We shouldn't forget the political infrastructure, laws, administration, institutions, and finally also security infrastructure, armed forces, police, and prison systems. For all of these kind, uh, the four levels or types of infrastructure investment, there are possible PPPs and we will come back to that uh, later on. Next. Now, when thinking about investment and when thinking about also of different forms of investment, we should bear in mind, it could go, as you see on this chart, from left to right, meaning it could all be done by the government or it could be done through some mixing and uh, participation of the private sector. As you see on the sliding scale from left to the right, it could go all the way to privatization or in between there is PPPs and I will say more about that shortly. The next. So um, the policy, policy choices. As I mentioned before, governments could do infrastructure investment by themselves provided they have funds, provided tax income is flowing and they can go about uh, doing that. And I think it's uh, certainly more the case in countries where the tax system and, and trust in authorities are very high. They could also go to uh, traditional procurement, <clears throat> provided it's uh, a corruption-free uh, professional form of procurement. Then we could have PPPs, but I will show you later on in another slide, there are all sorts of PPPs and oftentimes neither the government nor necessarily the public are aware of what this means and what are the risks for both the commercial partner or for the government. We could also think about privatization leading to investment in public um, in, in infrastructure, but I would say that should only make sense if it doesn't mean that a public monopoly becomes a private monopoly and at the end the rent seeking will uh, uh, make it less possible to have an efficient form of investment in, in infrastructure. And finally, the PPPs. As you might have heard in terms of UNECE, where I'm a member of the Bureau and other speakers as well, uh, there is this new, the coinage of, of a new term that is to move from value for money, that's the traditional form of PPPs, to value for money and value for society. And we will say a bit more about that shortly. Next. Next. Yes. Okay. Here is the list of some of the kinds of PPPs. Now build on transfer, build, lease, and transfer, build.
build, operate, and transfer. I think you can see it all listed here. The, the reason why I'm listing it here is probably most of you watching this uh, uh, webinar are not aware of the, what these terms all mean or the acronyms. Now, this is worth to become more informed, particularly if governments and civil society are in, in involved in such kind of PPP investments, because it means different kinds of levels of risk for government or for the commercial partner and also for the stakeholders who are involved in such PPP projects. So I just want to put flag this, there are all kinds of PPPs with all, all kinds of risks that go with it. Next. So um, now there are ways to help um, government, uh, public sector investors who, who go into infrastructure investment to also follow lines of good conduct. It's also, sometimes also called responsible business conduct. And there are four, for instance, instruments. The first one is the OECD responsible business con uh, uh, conduct guidelines, which are now in the fourth revision, go back to 2011, and they cover ground. They cover, as a quite, uh, uh, um, um, they're, they're covering a large level or large amounts of very important aspects of infrastructure investments, such as how to handle human rights, how to uh, be also mindful about conditions for employment, how to avoid bribery, uh, consumer interests, science and technology, competition and taxation. So you see from that, there are guidelines which cover almost, I would say, most of what businesses should be concerned with when they go into investment in infrastructure. Then we have <clears throat> also the UN guiding principles, which look at ways to better guide business so they wouldn't, in that sense, infringe on or violate human rights. That goes back to 2014. But like the OECD guideline, it's non-binding. Then we have the ILO declaration uh, uh, go about principles for multinational companies to be mindful about social policy, particularly labor rights. That's also non-binding, but there is a new attempt now by a, a group of countries and also NGOs within OHCHR of the United Nations to create a binding treaty, which in that sense will make it uh, mandatory for uh, companies to respect certain conditions of human rights. Next. Now, when it comes to uh, the current situation in terms of finances, we have a bit of a paradox. On one hand, as we hear uh, could read from uh, Stieglitz, there's an enormous amount of money kind of idle sitting in the, the treasury uh, the, me uh, the numbers are mentioned that it, it has moved from 1.5 to 2.9 trillion US dollars, which are sitting basically unused and I guess waiting for uh, an investment which would uh, guarantee uh, enough return on investment and secure investment. So there is money available waiting to be invested. The question is, how could we help bring this amount of money to a fruitful form of investment based on the ESG um, uh, conditions or the ESG principles that we will be talking about later on. Next. So here is an overview about the SDGs, the, the Sustainable Development Goals or the 2030 Agenda. As you can see in different colors, there are larger areas where the 17 goals, the 17 goals are in the outer circle, are grouped together to make it easier to understand the importance of the different SDGs. You have some that are focusing on improving governance, others on natural capital, the environment, others about also climate change and empowerment of human, young beings in different forms from gender to uh, taking care of decent work as, we, as well and basic needs. So basically, I'm, I'm suggesting that if we, you know, think about the money needed, as well as the money that is available, the question is how to best invest this through 
ESG, and I will explain a bit more what, what ESG is, but though it flows into these uh, SDGs, which are, uh, have been agreed by our governments, which guarantee best to move towards a sustainable future for all of us. Next. So now let me say something about the uh, ESGs. What is it? <clears throat> Actually, it's quite a new term. And it goes back to uh, publications and uh, it goes back to initiatives which have been taken by the Global Compact together with the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank Group and the Swiss government by following the suggestion by the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan to look for ways to make finances also become more uh, sustainable or more supportive of sustainability. Next one. So here are the three um, uh, capitals, uh, capital letters that are part of ESG. EG stands for environmental criteria. So that financing should in that sense be put into infrastructure or into investment, which will be low carbon or, uh, em uh, emissions, which would help reduce the risk of climate change. S stands for social criteria to find ways to invest in a way that communities, individuals also through better labor relations would be uh, uh, benefiting from such investment and then also through that contribute to the country's development. Next one. And then we have chief for governance. That's the uh, internal system within a company to be uh, ruled by criteria which make sense, which are rational, and which could guide the company towards a sustainable form, not only of investment, when it goes into investment, but also just in general, to operate based on criteria which are close to sustainability. Now, if you look at the bottom, it shows that so far what um, uh, uh, Kel has uh, come up with in terms of figures, going back to 2018, we're talking about a lot of money, 20 trillion, according to him and his assessment, 20 trillion of assets under management are now going under the guidance or under the principles of ESG. Some very much so, some only partially. Next. So uh, the findings based on the research which has been done by CFA and PRI uh, covering 1,100 um, investors and fund managers, they were asked, well, tell us what, what's happening in terms of ESG factor in terms of your own funding and funding uh, practice. What they said was in terms of governance, that's quite so, and companies and investment follows principles of governance. What is much less the case is when it comes to environmental and particularly to the social factors of sustainable investment. And I think we will have uh, colleague speakers and panelists who will say more about it. So basically what's missing is enough um, attention given to the S and to the E of the ESG. Next. Well, um, what, what we should think about is what to do if you think about the business, if we consult businesses, uh, what to suggest to them. And they should also be know, be, become aware that now with all the instruments that I made reference to in a previous slide from the OECD guidelines to the ILO um, declaration, there are rules that it is worth to bear in mind and to respect and to follow in order not to run into big problems. And I say more about the big problem, but that's just now to be a bit on the negative side. There is of course the major part is also to be on the constructive positive side. It is also valuable for investors and companies to go for ESG investment. And my uh, uh, colleague speakers will say more about that next. So the risks, <clears throat> um, we should, uh, in that sense, let the 
companies know and investors know if there is violation of these standards uh, and guidelines that I mentioned uh, before, then uh, it could lead to really a lot of trouble. And I will say much more in, in the next slide. Next. Uh, uh, okay, that's the end at the same time of my presentation, but, say, but, but wanting to conclude with just one last message. It would be very wise for companies and investors and the trust fund managers who advise the uh, in investors to go for ESG, but to respect also the best standards that I've been mentioning before. Because if they don't respect these standards, it could lead to complications. It could lead to public problems in terms of a loss of reputational capital, which if that's so, let's remember companies, when they lend money to companies, they want to know how high is the risk of this company. And if a company is seen as being violating basic standards of investment and of business, the interest rates go, go up. So it doesn't make sense commercially, but most of all, not following these principles makes the company look like uh, it's not a company which also is interested in creating value for society. I'm closing on my presentation. Thank you very much. We'll now listen to the Executive Director of UBS Wealth Management Sustainable Investing Advisory, Jaume Iglesias who is going to explain to us uh, in what way uh, can health wealth management industry and what it is doing to evaluate and ponder the economic social and governance dimension in investment decisions uh, be helpful maybe also to assess the way long-term uh, PPP investments can use these techniques uh, and derive uh, some of the learnings. Jaume advises clients on investment solutions that consider social and environmental values alongside financial returns. He addresses the key issue of how wealth can deliver more than financial returns. Prior to joining UBS in 2005, he worked for 11 years at Deutsche Bank, where he was head of investments and product management of Deutsche Bank Pensions and Life. Jaume is a fellow of the International Actuarial Association. He holds a bachelor's degree in mathematical economics and a master's degree in financial markets from the University of Barcelona. He is a visiting lecturer in impact and sustainable investing at leading academic institutions. And today we have the privilege of having him uh, to explain to us how the actual implementation of ESG is being done in investment decisions. Jaume, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Jean Christophe. Uh, warm welcome from my side. Uh, I, I look after sustainable investing advisory at UBS, and my job revolves around meeting with clients that have an affinity to sustainability. And I would say that the industry in general has come a long way. Started sustainable investing as a very small thing a long time ago. But uh, this is an industry that has I mean, we've seen incredible growth over the last few years. And, and the last two, three years have been uh, fantastic, I would say, better than anyone could ever uh, expect. And one, one of the questions that we often get from investors is, why is that, that this has been so successful? And then if we move, please, to the next slide, try to capture here uh, what sustainable investing means uh, when I think about sustainable investing. And to me, it's just a, a proxy for well-run companies. And what, what I mean by that is, in reality, it's just common sense investing. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's having so much success lately. Because if you think how you want to invest your money, one of the things that most likely would make sense for you to consider is whether the, the employers treat well their employees. And certainly that has a an, an social dimension, a human dimension. But if, even if you forget about those important things, in reality, what you want to do is you want to invest in companies that have motivated employees, right? Companies that attract the talent, companies that retain the talent. And it's difficult to understand the success of a company if you don't have good employees. I mean, it's almost impossible, right? So that's why sustainable investing tries to look into things like 
how much diversity uh, companies have because it, it's not really a good investment if you all of a sudden give up 50% of the potential talent or good working conditions or the amount of time and money that you invest in training and human capital development. So exactly the same thing happens with corporate governance. What we're trying to invest in companies that have sound risk management, no corruption, independence of board members, because that will result hopefully in no fines. You will have your license to operate. You, you won't have any big scandal. And that's just good for investments. And same thing with clients. You want to have loyal clients. The best thing to have loyal clients is to have safe and, and quality products. So I guess the ultimate question is for PPPs, and I'm coming from a completely different angle than PPPs, but just sharing the experiences from, from my, my little world is what we have seen in the private investment world is that the addition or incorporation of ESG criteria has helped not only to satisfy the needs of the, the very large number of investors who care about social and uh, environment, but also just purely uh, profit optimization. And we'll see that on the next slide when we compare just hardcore figures and uh, can, can we move please to the next slide? And then you, there's just simply a comparison between the performance over the last 30 years between the Standard and Poor's 500, so SP500, Wall Street, kind of, and the KLD400, which was the first social index that was launched that, um, almost 30 years ago. So we have now enough experience to know how this behaves. And as you can see, they behave very similarly, but the sustainable index has actually overperformed the Standard & Poor's 500 for around 50, almost 50 pips every year. So even if you have a completely disbelief in climate change and treating employees and, and governance issues, purely from the selfish investment point of view, you should not disregard these factors because you're actually making more money. Right? If we move please to the next slide, then what we can see is why, why investors are ready to pay what they're ready to pay for each stock. And you see here on the left-hand side, starting year 1975, moving to 2015, and the, the, the greenish area responds to the tangible assets. So investors were in 1975 ready to pay more than 80% of what they were paying based on intangible, tangible assets. So things that you could touch, machine, inventory, building stable, so to speak, right? And this percentage has grown dramatically over the last years. And today more than, um, now we're saying 85, 84%, but actually it's even more than that. It's intangible assets. And these intangible assets revolve around ESG, revolve around things that are very hard to measure things which are very hard to identify, yet we all know that they are responsible for the big, big part of evaluation of a company. It might be, does this company have loyal clients? Does this company have the right talent? Does this company or is this company able to attract the right talent from competitors? Does this company have the good branding, the good reputation, has strong risk management? All these things that just encapsulate in ESG. If we move please to the next slide, what we see is that the interest on this field has um, grown massively uh, as, as the asset reflect, but essentially trying to, trying to simplify the, the three types of clients that we find. On the left-hand side, you, you see that there's this client that says, no interest, it. climate change is a fad. Okay, fine, good. Uh, right, no comment. Then on the right-hand side, we, we see uh, this is around... 20% of the clients that say, yes, finally, someone talking to me about something meaningful. And in between, we have these clients who are kind of open to sustainable investing, and we call them the why not. If you add up the open to a side plus the yes, finally, you have like three quarters of investors in general, they are interested in SI. Now, the question for me, which is relevant is, because there's three quarters of clients who are interested, will the ESG factors become the, the, the next minimum acceptable standards from clients so that if you don't have it, you simply can't sell. We're not there yet, but I think we're starting to see the transition into that uh, situation. And that might be, I guess, something that PPPs could also see in the near future where 
if you don't adhere to minimum ESG standards, you're simply out of the game. If we move to the next slide, and just to conclude, one of the uh, sub-asset classes, as we call it in the financial world, which has seen an explosion over the last few years is the, the so-called green bonds. These are regular bonds, but they have environmental benefits. And you see that the assets, the assets under management have grown exponentially. And, um, and they are used both by private corporates and also by states and sovereigns to launch projects that have a clear environmental benefit. So one of the uh, questions that we could think of is whether this um, expansion of assets and being captured by green bonds uh, can become an alternative to finance green PPPs in the future, because there's more and more interest from investors into uh, deploying money into this kind of instruments. And I'll pause here and I'll over to you, Jean Christophe. Thank you very much, Homer, for these insights into how the investment industry is doing that in wealth management. Uh, Professor Dr. Mahmoud Moyeldin uh, is the UN Special Envoy on Financing the 2030 Agenda. He has served many years as Minister of Investment in Egypt, where he oversaw, amongst other, the implementation of the PPP legislation and also sat on the board of the Central Bank of Egypt. Until recently, he was Senior Vice President for the 2030 uh, Agenda at, uh, at, at UN Relations and Partnerships at the World Bank Group. He has authored numerous publications and articles in leading journals in the field of economics, finance, and development in English and Arabic, and holds numerous leading positions in think tanks, research centers, and academic institutions all over the world. I cannot wait to hear his insights on the role public-private partnerships play or need to play to achieve the UN 2030 agenda. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud uh, Moyeldin, for honoring us with your presence today. The floor is yours. All right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and good morning and uh, perhaps good evening uh, to you all for those who are listening and a great uh, pleasure and honor to be uh, with this distinguished um, uh, panel um, today. Um, so, um, yeah, let me build on the, um, the two important um, interventions by my uh, um, good two panelists who spoke before me. Um, um, Dr. Saylor and uh, Mr. Iglesias. And I'm just try to link what is happening at uh, the global level um, and what is happening at the project uh, level and um, the communities and the, um, the local um, um, uh, level. Uh, because at the end of the day, these PPP uh, projects um, are dealing with essential um, activities, services, and uh, support for, um, uh, for, for people, um, especially if they are engaged in essential um, uh, utilities, infrastructure, and the variety of sectors that were described by the previous um, uh, speakers. Um, so um, since the talk about the, uh, the PPP uh, started, and there was an interest um, in it um, like 15 years ago, and, and more as a kind of a good modality uh, for funding. Um, uh, since that day, I think until now, we can really comfortably say that there is still a great potential for uh, PPP uh, to be realized. Um, infrastructure is still uh, being financed through conventional uh, modalities from budget side or uh, from support, direct support of development finance um, an institution. Uh, PPPs uh, do not really have that significant uh, contribution in low income countries, in uh, countries that do not really have a good uh, track record for um, investments, despite the fact that there have been a great deal of improvement on the legal frameworks in establishing PPP units, in uh, improving the regulatory uh, structures, but we're still constra constrained by many, many matters related to capacity, to the um, um, pipeline of quality projects, to a disclosure um, um, for uh, what is happening in the field of the existing projects, and to what extent that the kind of contracts we have today 
are flexible enough to accommodate um, the, the changes, the expectations of the public, even before COVID-19, and now higher expectation of the public to have better quality work, focusing on essential areas related to the health uh, sector, for instance, education sector, the digital uh, platform that need to be created, and uh, uh, indeed, as mentioned by the previous um, uh, speakers, full adherence to um, ESG and uh, trying to achieve the SDGs. Um, uh, big ambitious goals, and we are very much constrained, but hopefully the current crisis is a good reminder of what we should be doing going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the, the kind of crisis that we are having today, uh, today has been mentioned. Uh, it's a kind of a per perfect storm. Health uh, shock, real economy shock, um, with the, um, um, the negative growth in, in, in countries around the world, more than 170 countries are going to be seeing their per capita income uh, growing negatively. Um, um, uh, estimates of growth range from minus 3% by the IMF in April. Um, um, a few days ago, OECD and the World Bank are telling us that globally growth could be uh, in more than minus uh, five, so this is going to be a decline in growth uh, and contraction of economic activity. And in some countries, they might be realizing a contraction of up to uh, minus 10% as it may happen in some of the European um, uh, um, uh, countries. Um, but these are, are pro uh, projections still, and they are being revised. And it's all about the how the recovery is going to be uh, uh, realized. And people are still with optimism to talk about a U-shape, though that the V-shape kind of recovery, um, uh, unless you are only focusing on the stock exchange and its behavior um, is not necessarily um, uh, the, the kind of more likely scenario. Um, um, then uh, you have this kind of volatility in the market. This is the kind of environment that anyone, even if you are very much as we should be, uh, focused on our own assignments in a particular design of our project. That could be a PPP project in some uh, low income or middle income or high income country. This kind of a context is, is very important because it has certain implications on, on, on the kind of work, on the kind of regulations and the competition um, and the market conditions. Next, please. Yeah, and, and just a reminder that we are not over it, despite the fact that uh, the, um, the pandemic is being put uh, under control, but many countries are still um, uh, struggling to flatten uh, the curves. There is some good performance in some countries, regardless of their governance structure, like Vietnam, for instance, or Greece. Um, so th there have been some interesting um, um, uh, positive developments in in, in, in some countries, including actually in the Middle East as well, we see countries like uh, Lebanon and Tunisia doing well in, in this front. So it's not really an issue of, 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 the, gov of the governance or uh, of the political uh, economy uh, basis, but based on, 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 on its differences, it's the capacity of the country in question to uh, manage a crisis better. And different, crisis, um, and different countries had their own ways of dealing um, with, this, um, with this crisis. And it, the crisis revealed um, the strength and weakness of many systems. And we need to be reminded of that because that can tell you something about risk management as well. Risk is not just about the project risk or the particular PPP kind of, uh, um, of arrangement that you may have, or uh, even the country risk. It's much more complicated than that. Next, please. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, yeah, all kinds of possibilities of growth are linked to the performance on the health side. And this is from a recent Brookings uh, study, which is basically telling us to what extent countries can go back to the uh, anticipated uh, trend or the warranted trend, uh, trend of growth, a V-shaped or a Nike um, swoosh-shaped um, recovery or a W-shaped recovery, or L-shaped, or a Z-shaped, or a U-shaped recovery. All of these kind of shapes are basically corresponding like a mirror to the performance 
in the health side. So if you have a W-shaped recovery, it's very likely that it is corresponding to an M-shaped kind of a performance on the health sector, that you had an increase, a decline, a second wave, and a decline. Uh, but all of these are possible scenarios. What um, for the world, and, and more importantly, given that people are talking now about more of national level, more local level, what's really happening in the, um, in the economic environment of the projects that you are conducting in the particular area of focus. Next, please. Yeah, this is a kind of a dashboard um, of, the, um, of the state of the economic um, um, conditions of, uh, from the recent uh, global economic prospects of the World Bank Group. And it tells you what I just mentioned the, uh, about growth and how it is going to be declining in advanced economies, emerging ma markets economies, and the global economy at, at large. Uh, trade growth, um, many assumptions came from WTO from minus 13% to minus 35% of decline. FDI is expected to decline uh, between 35% to 45% based on some estimates, including from the UNCTAD. Um, um, we have as well decline in, in remittances by no less than 20%. And we have seen the, uh, um, the increase, meanwhile, of global debt uh, the, from government, private sector, and the household sector, in, including the increase of the cost of borrowing in many emerging markets uh, uh, and middle income borrowers um, uh, during the last few weeks. And some countries cannot just access the market despite some improvement in liquidity, but still the cost is still very high for many middle income countries to tap on the market. They put that into consideration because this is one of the possible sources of funding. And uh, the, um, uh, Mr. Iglesias talked about the bond market as a potential uh, source. And, and, and that is being affected as we speak, at least in the short term. Yeah, this, this is just an elaboration of what's happening in the market and their uh, volatility. And the commodities markets are well, as well are seeing some uh, interesting developments, especially in the oil prices. So it's a kind of an environment that you cannot really assume if you are an investor that it is really um, a, a, a market that gives you all what you need of necessary information to conduct your business. So you need to really to work under the different scenarios of taking decisions under uncertainty. Next, please. Yeah, um, again, a reminder that all of what we have been seeing today um, in SDG three, Sustainable Development Goal number three, the one related to health, is not a black swan. It is not really an, um, um, uh, an event that people shouldn't have been uh, well prepared for. There have been a variety of different reports uh, at the national level, at the global level, including the report that came from the Joint um, uh, Commission, Independent Commission, um, uh, for um, the preparedness, uh, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. And uh, th that report is available to tell us that uh, actually in, back in, uh, in, in September when this uh, report was published, as if we were described the situation that we are in today. They are not um, uh, fortune tellers. They are not um, with a crystal ball. These are all uh, professionals who have been in this area, including the former uh, director and former prime minister of Norway, um, who have been in this business, in addition to many practitioners who told us clearly that as far as SDG 3 is concerned, the countries, including advanced economies, are not adequately prepared to deal with um, a, a health uh, shock. Um, and they didn't really benefit from all of the shock that we have been seeing, uh, H1N1, SARS, um, and more recently, Ebola. I hope that the current crisis is telling us something about, about this area. And this is a potential area for public-private partnership. And I know, of course, that the social sector is not really as simple as the infrastructure and utility sector when you are conducting the PPP for a long-term uh, kind of a contract, but it is doable. And we have seen in, 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 in the studies very good examples of social sector uh, PPP projects. Next, please. Yeah, so the previous speakers talked about ESG and the SDG and how can you, how can you link them together? 
So perhaps, um, well, if you are going to be spending uh, the rest of the time today to talk about the 17 goals, the 169 targets, and 230, uh, uh, 230 indicators, that will take us for, forever. But here, this is a good way, perhaps, to um, describe the SDGs with the ESG. So the E and the S and the G, forget the economic dimension for a minute. So we have here the environmental um, uh, dimension, which is basically SDGs um, 13, 14, and 15, including climate change. And then you have the social dimension or areas related to uh, um, gender equality, uh, income equality, all of the investments required for the human capital, including education and health, and the social dimension. And then you have the governance dimension, which is SDG 16. So this is a good way of presenting the SDGs in an ESG format. And um, I'm saying that uh, for the following reason, the governance dimension, especially at the corporate level, had been always taken seriously since the inception of the ESG. The environmental dimension during the last few years, especially with the Paris Agreement, started to, take, to get some traction. And there have been great opportunities either in the investments for adaptation or mitigation. So the E got bigger. The G had been already there, but the E got big, uh, bigger. What happened after this crisis that the social dimension, the S, got even bigger than the E and the G after many years of um, marginalizing it? So the, and, and how to quantify for that, how to make good tracking of the performance of companies, including uh, the companies or the projects that are conducting PPPs is going, actually it's, it's now, I, I was following that closely and you will be really perhaps happily surprised of the number of uh, companies and specialized entities doing nothing but by tracking ESG. How in the past, a good CEO will go for a big event, inviting people. I love the environment. I love my people. I love governance. And you would just give you a kind of a colorful report on what they want, they are doing. Now there are principles for impact investing. Now there are some good methodology that they have to be uh, applying. Now there are regulators are expecting uh, disclosures ba disclosure based on good methodology and good transparency. And it is not really up uh, now to you if you are involved with public money in public domain to say what you like. So the, stan the, the, the standards are getting um, uh, better and the tracking is getting better. And the technology is allowing us to do that in a more cost-effective um, uh, way um, in the business. So this is the ESG. And this, as I was uh, almost telling my colleagues at the IFC, this is their domain, this is their good work. But if your company, if your PPP is not really affiliated with a development entity, be it national or international, it's for, for IFC as the oldest uh, private sector arm of a development agency, development can come natural. Developmental impact is not an area of worry. But if you are conducting that business, while you're not coming from the, this development background, you need to demonstrate in addition to your ESG, you need to demonstrate your economic uh, contribution. In what way you are doing better in the inclusive growth dimension. Um, um, in, in, in contributing to the revenue of the community and the, the national um, uh, budget of the country that is hosting you. So that needs really to be fully factored in, in any kind of work of a, B, of a PPP project or corporate project to, to be in full compliance with the SDG. While you are doing good in the ESG, you need really to demonstrate what you are doing in the developmental side, which is normally neglected in the reporting. Um, perhaps it might be just being given for granted, but it needs really to be, uh, to be reported on. Next, please. Yeah, with all of these crises that we are facing today in the, um, uh, in the human side, on the health side, on the financial, and on the, on, on the, um, on the economic performance and the real economy side, the only answer is investment. The only answer is investment. Yes, it's perhaps not really the best hour, the best day, the best moment to talk about investment now, 
but actually many people are seeing good opportunities for investment. Some of that are a kind of opportunistic uh, kind of behavior to see an asset here and there or, or a project that is struggling with liquidity, so you go and acquire it. But now with the attention, as I was trying to say, on to matters related to health, building a health system, building a primary health care, this is a very big domain for a public-private partnership. You can just take it from the units that need to be established in the districts, in the villages, in the, in the, in the, in the smallest zones of your country, to linking that all together with the whole system, with technology, and to apply the standards. Difficult than building a road or a, or, a, or a seaport or an airport, but this is now going to be more on demand. This is an area of great work and the budgets being constrained today cannot do it on their own, the state budgets. Um, again, education. Now to, people are talking about blended education, establishing platforms and all of that, another area of good work. Um, scaling up um, the, the, uh, the labor force, training centers, linking them to digital technology. And then you need to invest in resilience. All of the, what I talked about when it comes to climate change uh, in the adaptation side or the mitigation side. And uh, there are some good examples in that as well in, in areas related to disaster risk management. Um, and then the, in, the investment in infrastructure. All what we have been doing in this is important, but we need really, as I said, we need to increase the input the, the portion or the ratio of PPP to total uh, investment, uh, especially middle income and low income countries, but we need as well to invest more in the DNA, the data systems, the networks, and um, everything that could benefit from artificial intelligence. Um, next, please. So here there are three real life examples from the far southeast to the far uh, northwest to Europe. And there are many examples as well in the emerging markets. And here you need really, when you are designing these things, you need really to see what is really happening. Canada, for instance, there is an issue of, of debt uh, uh, facing many uh, uh, corporations. Governments, as many uh, countries have done, government has stepped in, but they did it smartly with positive conditionality. If you want re uh, debt relief, you need really to connect your effort of um, uh, of debt relief, and we're going to be providing you money as government, but you need really to show us that you are recovering better, that you are going to be linking your activities to being more friendly to some rules related to climate change or environment or sustainability at large. Um, and some good announcements were made by the Prime Minister of Canada um, uh, um, early May. Um, another example is from New Zealand. And here the crisis has uh, had accelerated what was prepared for many years about disclosure of projects, including that will affect the markets, the PPP included, about what you were considering to be doing voluntarily. Now there will be some mandatory uh, disclosure when it comes to areas related to climate related uh, finance. If you are getting money from the system, banking system, or the financial markets, so you are going to be disclosing um, based on some rules. Here, the disclosure is going to be helping you to be more aligned with what is being expected. And Europe, of course, uh, many of you are based there and you are aware of the efforts by the European Commission to borrow together, benefiting from the low cost of borrowing and to spend it on recovery. And the condition again is to recover better, more green, more uh, inclusive um, uh, activities and more digital solutions. Next, please. Yeah, so um, in the good preparations and many thanks again for uh, John Christophe and, uh, and the team when we were preparing for this presentation, I was just asked to add a slide to connect all of these kind of things to what is happening at, um, at the UN today. Uh, some of you may have followed that mini summit of the 28th of May, talking about finance, debt management, debt vulnerability, role of private sector creditors, external finance for inclusive growth, recovering better for sustainability and how to invest um, uh, in areas related to climate and how to deal with the illicit financial flows. This event was attended by 50 heads of state including from Europe, Africa, Latin America, and of course, Asia was represented and Japan was there as well. Um, OECD countries, emerging markets, um, uh, low-income countries, all were represented. 
international organizations were there, World Bank, IMF, IIF, OECD with their private sector participation from the International Chamber of Commerce and other civil society were there as well, um, uh, contributing to the discussion um, um, and many think tanks were there. So um, this is just a launching of good discussion about to deal with these kind of very sensitive areas that are dominating the news and more importantly are dominating the way that societies and people are being affected with the financial uh, financial sector and the debt matters and uh, we are trying to do our best because issues related to finance are not just on <clears throat> the business of the finance institution they have political implications today they have security implications as well if matters are getting out of hand uh, when it comes to debt vulnerability in particular um, so we are launching the discussion groups. Actually, this week we have um, a meeting in a couple of hours to launch the discussion groups. So um, I'm updating you of things as they happen. And they are all going to be on the open so you can access the discussion. Some of you actually are going to be invited for some of these discussion groups based on the areas of interest and uh, domain. And then there is going to be a ministerial meeting, a finance uh, ministerial meeting in September before the heads of state uh, meeting um, and uh, during the uh, UN General Assembly to discuss these six areas, to make sure that we are moving forward, preventing a crisis, trying to recover um, and build back better, requires really this kind of political leadership as the technical solution. Finally, I think I have a slide that sums it all and raise some issues as well. So this, this current crisis had all of these factors. It had a revealing effect, it revealed strengths and weakness um, of countries, as I mentioned. It had accelerated things, bad things and good things together. And it, um, it has as well as all crises, these kind of uh, factors and dynamics to revert to the mean, that people would like to go back to what they assume as normal. So these factors between the acceleration, the revealing factor and the, and the reverting to the mean are going to be shaping the, um, this kind of a new normal in a fast changing world. The world has been always changing, but during the last decade in particular, it had seen fast changes with the industrial revolution, with climate change and others in the positive and negative sides um, of areas when it comes to investment. But what you need to do is basically six areas when it comes to uh, PPP. Coexisting with COVID-19, especially for your business. How are you managing it better from the micro side? and in the relationship with government. And what are the uh, opportunities that could be there for new lines of business that were not there for COVID-19 with the same kind of, uh, of size. Fighting recession is all about investment and spending. What could be the role of PPP on that? Harnessing debt challenges. You go to the Minister of Finance, Mr. Minister, you are constrained. You are going to be accumulating debt. I'm giving you a solution based on private sector. I'm taking part of the burden, but let's have a decent contract with good regulation for that. We need to embrace digitalization in our work, even if we are not in digital, digital is part of the solution. Even if you are doing one of the most basic infrastructure, like building a sewage um, um, network um, for some remote villages, that needs really to benefit from this kind of digitalization. And then adopting localization here, it's, this is the big thing that development is not just about big cities and big harbor areas or big connecting um, hubs around the world. It will be there as well for, for governorates, for states, for big districts that didn't really have a fair share of opportunities, they would be asking for that. So PPP as investment will come to that. And finally, you need to deal really and be prepared in good coordination with a new role for the state. After crisis, and as we see it today, one don't need to wait. How many signals are you getting now for more interventions by the state? Some of the interventions are benign. Some of the interventions for the investors may not be seen as benign. There will be variety of regulations. The policymakers and the legislators and the lawmakers are going to be competing for new regulations almost for everything. It could be the responsibility for the industry to start early by giving guidance and suggestions on what could be effective regulations. And then be wary of the interventions. Sometimes you may need to live with them in some areas and, and jurisdictions, especially if they are going to be getting bigger like Olivia thought.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud, for this excellent tour d'horizon on all the potential uh, cases how to apply uh, PPPs. Without further ado, we'll pass the word to Ziad Alexandre Hayek, who is the president of the World Association of PPP Units and Professionals. Uh, Ziad uh, is also the vice chair of the Working Party on PPP of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe and high commissioner of the World Business Angel Investment Forum for Lebanon. Following a long career in international finance, and as investment banker with Citibank, Salomon Brothers, and Suez Capital, Burr and Stearns. He led the Republic of Lebanon's High Council for Privatization and PPPs for 12 years until he was nominated for president of the World Bank Group. He owns Hayek Associates, a PPP advisory boutique, and sits on numerous boards. And it's my pleasure to listen or to give uh, Ziad now the floor to give us a, an ESG primer for PPP units. Thank you very much, JC. Appreciate it. Um, delighted to be with this distinguished panel and with all of you today. Um, I am uh, going to go to the more micro, if you like, uh, even though the topic is macro, but I'm going to go to the micro and I'm going to talk about, you know, how PPP units um, should look at ESG. And I think in our business, this is, um, you know, this, uh, we're failing at that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this has been mentioned by uh, my previous co-panelists. Um, the numbers might be a little bit more, a little bit less, but basically we are seeing a huge interest in, in ESG investments now exceeding $30 trillion. Uh, the reasons for that are that millennials are a lot more sensitive to investing in, uh, in ESG and are more sensitive to sustainability. Um, mutual funds, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds uh, have become more and more important in the market and they are asking for longer, because they, they typically invest in long-term assets, they want to make sure that these assets are gonna be there, uh, not just uh, you know, look good when the pitch is made but they want them to look good 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road. So they want them to be sustainable. Um, more, uh, 49 stock exchanges now publish uh, information on ESG uh, related to uh, stocks that are traded on, on their exchanges. More than 350 large asset managers, managers have committed to ESG principles. And I, you know, I mean, Amundi, BlackRock, uh, et cetera. I mean, the list goes on and on, there are many of them. 97 financial institutions in 37 countries have committed to the equator principles. Now the equator principles are a little bit like the predecessor, if you like, of the environmental part of ESG. But uh, this is very important because if, you're, um, if your project doesn't meet the equator principles, it's almost impossible to get it financed. And um, there's the people first PPP concept and the G20 quality infrastructure investment uh, that have gained widespread recognition, and I will talk a little bit about that later on. So you're sitting um, in your PPP unit, uh, typically you know, dealing with the politicians in your government on one side and dealing with investors and consultants on the other side. And maybe you have a PPP unit that's within the ministry, or maybe it is, it is independent and it has to deal with the ministry. And, this becomes your world. You are no longer thinking about other things. And what I'm trying to do today is to encourage you is to think beyond that. Because there are, like I said, more than $30 trillion worth of um, potential money that can come your way to invest in your project. And if you're not conscious of that huge pool, which is const constantly growing, you are going to miss out on big opportunities. You're going to pay more for the financing of your projects. Um, and it's gonna, you'll find it harder to finance these projects. Um, I'm, I'm listing here, uh, this is uh, now old, but, uh, you know, but still it's, it's very relevant. Actually, it, if anything, it has grown. Uh, there are, these are companies that are following ESG. Um, you can see Bloomberg, for example, it has ESG indices, it has ESG ratings, the FTSE, the Morgan Stanley uh, index, uh, Reuters, 
all of these people are looking at ESG and rating it. Next slide, please. So, but as I was saying, ESG is really not taking off among PPP units around the world. And, and why is that? It's because most of the time, other than, like I said, spending time with your being involved and busy with your environment, uh, projects are still awarded like construction projects. I mean, everybody still thinks of infrastructure PPPs. I'm going to build a toll road. I'm going to build an airport. I'm going to build a port. I'm going to build a railroad. And how am I going to how am I going to award the contract? Well, I'm going to look at you know at you know construction companies and how they can build and how much is it going to cost and things like this. So so the SG aspect is not being paid attention to. Um, environmental and social impact assessment is usually left to the winning bidder to do. So it's like we don't have money in our budget preparation, uh, you know, for budget preparation. Uh, we, can ha we have barely enough money, the Ministry of Finance is giving us barely enough money to pay for, for the consultants. So, uh, and, and, you know, we, we are in a hurry as well. The politicians are pushing us. Uh, the project that should take, that should take, you know, two, three years to, uh, to award, they want it in three months. And so I'm not gonna do the full econo uh, environmental impact assessment. What do I do? Well, you know, I say, I'm gonna leave it to the winning bidder. Once they win the bid uh, and before they start the project, they have to do the environmental impact assessment. You know, guess what? You're late. You're late because you awarded the bid and you're no longer taking advantage of the financing, you know, of the cheaper financing. Now, a lot of this has to do with educating politicians. And unfortunately, I know that this is very difficult, but we at WAP are doing our best to do that on a regular basis. And we are happy to work with you if you want us to uh, provide uh, assistance to you in not only in how your laws can be adjusted in order to f fit the SG aspects within them, but also how to educate politicians on this. They should not, if if they want the project done quickly, they should finance it with government money. They should not look at PPP. PPP has to be done, you know, with time. And, and uh, especially if you're going to get good financing deals from, um, you know, you need to structure your project, right? The um, information about the project and the pipeline is usually not com communicated to investors early on. So even, you know, you may have done your studies, et cetera, and you launch the project, you launch the tender, but the investors are taken unawares by it and they're surprised. They, they need more time. They have no time themselves to look at the ESG aspects and get better financing. Uh, stakeholders and rating agencies tend not to be consulted. So, you know, I've, I've seen it time and again. You know, PPP units look always, especially in emerging markets, What's the World Bank gonna finance me at? You know, I'm talking to the IFC, I'm talking to the World Bank, I'm talking to EIB, I'm talking to EBRD. Guess what, guys? That's not the entire financing spectrum that there is out there. There are zillions of investors. Don't be stuck with this idea that these are the only few people that are going to finance me. Of course, they're not, you're not gonna get any financing other than from those people if you're not doing your, your homework right. Um, you need to, if you structure your project well, you consult rating agencies ahead of time, you can get it rated. If you get it rated, you have a much wider investor, uh, investor uh, universe to go to. Governments have not yet fully internalized PPP as a means to deliver on the SGs and uh, to enhance the SG dimension. Basically, you know, this is saying governments are still not seeing PPP as a development tool. They're just seeing it as a procurement tool. And we need to change that mindset. And PPP units are often not aware of the tools available from third parties for project ESG assessment. You can do a lot of the work with these third party software. And next slide, please. So here are, here are for example, a number of entities that can help you design a project and make sure that it is going to get proper ESG um, rating. Um, the, um, I mentioned here Envision, for example, UNEC is working with, with Envision and, and, and some other entities. 
Um, and we are, as UNECE, developing uh, impact assessment tool for that. So, but, but these are private sector entities that you can go to and make sure you have enough money in your project finance, in your project development budget to, to pay for such things. Next slide, please. Uh, Fitch ratings. So here you can see that, uh, you know, SNP also has started doing infrastructure ratings for projects. So you can see, you can get your project rated by one of the major uh, rating agencies. And next slide. So um, now we talked a lot about ESG and the thing is environment, social governance. Um, and a lot of time is spent on the environment and that's the easy part um, in terms of at least, you know, project structuring, et cetera, because since the nineties, this is, this is happening. The social impact uh, now is taking more of a uh, uh, role so we can see the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment. Uh, they emphasize, among other things, these are the criteria. They emphasize uh, the social aspect. Uh, you can see number five. If you like, one, two, and three, these are their principles, uh, are about uh, resilience and economic efficiency and uh, sustainable growth. So this is, you know, a lot of this has to do with the value for money. But uh, then you can see uh, ESG principles reflected in four, five, and six. Uh, next slide, please. Similarly, and um, some of these things are repetitious, but UNECE has uh, for a long time now been talking about people first PPP principles. And these are having, you know, making sure that people are benefiting from the project, not only value for money, but value for people. So the access and equity, access to services and equity among the users economic effectiveness and fiscal sustainability, environmental sustainability and resilience, replicability of the project and stakeholder engagement, working with society early on. Um, as you do these things, if you're going to work with society early on, you are going to create a much more uh, sustainable uh, project. Next slide, please. Um, on, aside from that, so we've talked about value for money, uh, we've talked about value for people, and um, our colleagues at CNET are developing something called an intergenerational redistributive effects model. So while the other rating models typically follow a KPI approach, uh, basically these are the KPIs, are you meeting this KPI or not? And then you're rated based on that. Uh, CNET has developed more of a financial model uh, that actually quantifies uh, the, uh, what they call value for people as well as value for future. And by that, they mean uh, value for future generations because PPP projects are long-term. Uh, PPP projects, uh, you know, sometimes are 20, 30 years. And uh, we oftentimes are always as PPP units thinking of the immediate, uh, what's gonna happen the next two, three years. And we really are not planning in our mind what is the impact of this project going to be on the future generation? And next slide, please. So um, this, is, um, this is just a slide to show that part of the model of how, um, of how a, for instance, in this case, how public debt emission compares to a PPP deal for, uh, the, from a generational perspective. And we are happy to provide you more information on that uh, should you be interested. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, PPP units will ignore ESG at their own risk uh, because then they're missing out on a lot of uh, op good opportunities for good financing. Um, there are a couple of things I also want to mention that I didn't mention. One is that, uh, like I said, a lot of attention has been paid to economic and social aspects. Very little, very little attention has been paid to governance. And from my dealings with the multilateral development banks, I know that uh, they have long checklists. They will ask you a zillion questions about, about the environmental aspect of this. But comes to governance, you know, it's like, you know, you, you go, you tell them, but guys, you know, this is a white elephant. Here, this, the minister, this is big corruption. They are, you know, this project is not structured correctly. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, this is, does it, you know, is it harming the environment? No, okay, then this is good. So, you know, 
please do not be, um, take, take this seriously. If you do not have the proper governance, if you are not fighting corruption, if you are not doing things right, your project, you'll be very happy the day you inaugurate it. And three years down the road, people are going to be maligning you. You know, you don't want that. You want your reputation to be saved for the longer term. So do your things right. Look at value for money, for sure. If the, va if the, if the project is not, um, you know, like, I mean, financially sound, it's not going to happen. Uh, look at value for money, but please look at value for people. And please look at value, value for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ziad. So now the floor is open for your questions. Uh, I have already received a couple of questions in the Q&A box. I'll read to you the first question and feel free uh, in the panelists to answer uh, in a succinct fashion. PPPs in some developing countries do not have very good reputation, especially in developing countries as some irresponsible investments from the private sector left all the burden to the governments and also have not invested in quality projects and what is actually needed in the country, but were looking only after their own interest. How can this be rectified? And what are the safeguards for that so that the companies do, just pay, do not just pay lip service to ESG and other regulations? Also, how are human rights being respected in developing countries when investments are done? Unfortunately, I don't have a name. It's an anonymous attendee, attendee but uh, let's give an answer to, to that, please. Who wants to go first? Probably let Joe may uh, re respond uh, related to the companies. Haume, would you like to answer? Please. How me? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so it's, I'm not coming from the PPP, so I can't really judge on what is the role of PPPs and what's been left to the governments. Uh, I think maybe just from my angle is uh, what is the um, what is the ability of EHG standards to improve a project, right? And uh, how much good they have brought over the last few years or not and because it's maybe maybe just a, a question of more general nature and i think it links back to also another question that was posted previously and what i would say is that the esg standards in general uh, i think trying to look at them critically what we have observed is that companies are getting better in relative terms so companies that try to follow esg standards definitely get better and uh, ESG uh, investments and the pressure from ESG investors and large society is helping companies to consume less water, to emit, emit less CO2, to have um, better working conditions for the employees. All this thing is true. Uh, yet there's a, there's a question always of relative versus absolute. So I think it's uh, companies are getting better in relative terms. Not all companies are getting better in absolute terms. What I mean by that is if we look at fashion company, for example, they, instead of consuming 300 liters per, per t-shirt, now they're consuming 200, which is already quite an improvement, right, for, for environment. Yet if we still keep um, buying stuff as if there would be no tomorrow, and, you know, I think on, on, in Europe on average, we buy like 27 or almost 30 pieces of new garment every year, then uh, nobody's gonna get us out of this mess. So ESG can do, can bring a lot, as long there's a, a kind of a, a, a movement of more general nature, which does not involve only companies, which I, and does not involve only governments, which we have the tendency to, to criticize. And I'm not saying that we don't have to, but I think there's also a, a, a role for consumers and for populations at large to try with their behavior to um, consume and invest responsibly. That's what I would say. I have another short question uh, for you from Ravi Shrari. Uh, how are the green bonds placed in terms of pricing and other terms versus debt instruments? Also, if uh, you can highlight in the time it would take, uh, how long is the time it would take to approve investment through such green bonds? Just, just to, to make it easy, in terms of uh, risk and return, they are identical to conventional bonds. Maybe there's one peep above, one peep below, but uh, the, the, the rule of thumb is they are identical. 
uh, in terms of approval, there's companies, it's not compulsory for companies to have a, a green bond approval stamp, so to speak, at least not yet. Although most of the companies do it just because of reputational issues. And then there's lots of companies that go through this external audit process and that, that just takes, that costs some money and, and delays the project, well not delays, but just takes some time. But it's quite efficient, I would say, all, all in all. And it gives you access to, uh, I think on average, there's uh, the, the issuers, they account for one third, a bit more than one third of new investors. So it gives you more resilience, access to wider pool of investors, which is all, all, also the company's value. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question uh, now. Uh, uh, yes, please. Yeah, John Christoph, uh, very quickly on the on the two issues uh, that were raised by the participants. On on the first one, we might be falling unless we're not very careful here. Um, and the issues related to being victims of what's available of data and what's not. So when you have the data, you tend to uh, go and measure and uh, the uh, the slogans about about what good measured, good uh, managed, and all of that. I think we shouldn't really be victims of that, as we are being warned by um, uh, the uh, uh, Professor Richard Thaler when he told us that we are always victims on this. Um, Richard Thaler is the Nobel Prize laureate and in economics. And, 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 and basically, there are many areas here of work that need, we need really to have the kind of acceptable measurement for, not for us just to focus on what we can measure and ignore some important issues of what does he add mentioned about this issue of value to the people and how can you measure it? If you don't really have the simple measurement, we need really to articulate uh, at least proxies. And now the industry is full of these kind of, of areas of work, including on governance, which is one of the most complicated um, 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 uh, ob uh, goals of, of, of sustainable development uh, to measure. But there have been some sort of agreed upon methodologies um, on, on this. The, the whole thing here is basically about reporting, standardization, and disclosure in a timely fashion. Um, that to, make, to make sure that we are all understanding what does it really mean if an India-based or China-based or Egypt or, um, or Brazil company is reporting on the same thing. We can, we can compare, we can price, we can assess risk, and we can really send the right signals to the policymakers and to the general public. The other thing is basically about the issue of, um, of bonds. Yes, there have been a great deal of variety of bond issuance, social bonds, green bonds, all colors, blue bonds for oceans. Um, uh, we have as well uh, the SDG equity linked bonds. They follow some simple structure for that. First, as mentioned uh, by Mr. Iglesias, that they don't fall um, into capturing what you should really be getting in a kind of a good conventional bond, the cost benefit analysis of, of the bond, its risk, its return assessment. But they have two additional factors. One is related to filtering out the bads, anything that could be harmful to the society, to the people um, um, being engaged in, uh, uh, in any kind of an activity that could really cause any kind of a disruption to um, the, the word towards uh, sustainability that should be filtered out. And then you need to filter in. Filtering in is easier because you can just link it to the SDGs. And you can see from the, the presentation uh, uh, by uh, Professor Sainer that there are huge opportunities that you can really link your bond uh, to. So um, two things here. I would refer perhaps to the SDG equity link bond that was issued by the World Bank a couple of years ago. In its structure, it's not the only example, but its structure is very simple. And the second thing is basically about operationalizing the impact investing principles and how to disclose them in order to make sure that we are talking about the same thing. And there is no ESG washing or SDG washing, people claiming what they are not doing. Thank you. Uh, one question for Raymond Zana, uh, also from an anonymous attendee. There are some very good companies who are serious about sustainability, but many do greenwashing. How to distinguish between the two so that consumers' clients are aware of it? Besides, many sustainability officers in the companies are just glorified procurement officers 
and are mostly focused on certification standards. How do we go beyond green building and oil drilling? Is the current pandemic a chance to bring stronger sustainability, especially in social and environmental areas, more to the forefront? Well, I would say uh, a lot of that was already answered by my predecessors. Um, I would just say, when it comes to human behavior, there's a similar principle also for companies. I do think behavior is guided by sanctions and incentives. We could get lost in writing plenty of documents and be euphoric about the ESG and things could go wrong, particularly now that we have COVID-19 um, reset and people will maybe struggle and forget about all the good intentions that they have made before and are trying to get the, the return on investment that they used to have. Uh, so we, we, we should bear in mind from the sanctions point of view, there are uh, instruments, I mentioned them, for instance, the OECD guideline, which becomes soft law, it becomes tighter. And the UN Open Working Group, which is now trying to make it, uh, in that sense, a binding tool, could help to prevent the often described unfortunate sudden change when a CEO leaves who was very much committed to, for instance, uh, corporate social responsibility, and his successor thinks this is garbage, <coughs> let's drop it. And there's no continuity. I think for the SDGs, <coughs> uh, and thanks uh, Dr. Maidin for, for bringing that back up, this means long-term commitment. And we have to figure out a way to use the current positive uh, developments, uh, also that um, was uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Iglesias, Iglesias, to capture that and to make it more permanent. Because things will change, that's inevitable. And if we don't have some form of, let's say, more than good intentions, uh, one incentive could be that all the public procurement should be based on assessment of good behavior of companies. As an, as an example, uh, I think we, we need to figure out something that's not going to be too bureaucratic, not too much uh, old times, um, which w w wouldn't work anyway, because some companies, will, if they're very opportunistic, they will figure out a way to navigate around it. But something more than uh, writing up the indices, publishing good intentions, that's great that this is happening but we have to add something to it so it becomes permanent, or at least more, uh, le less short-term and more long-term. Thanks. Thank you. We have another question from Salim Teliji. Uh, can Islamic finance contribute to the financing of PPP by respecting ESG criteria? I think Ziad or uh, Professor Mahmoud are probably the best experts <laughs> to, to give us an answer. Well, um, Professor, Professor Mahmoud is still uh, muted, so I, I maybe I'll go first until he unmutes himself. <laughs> um, of course it can. I think uh, Islamic finance is uh, really underutilized, just like uh, uh, attention to ESG investing is under, under paid not enough attention to. Uh, Islamic finance can be a fantastic instrument for PPP in general, regardless of whether it's ESG or not. Islamic finance basically is based on the sharing of risks. Um, and it is the true aspect of PPP. Uh, a lot more can be done there. Uh, the SG side of it also, I mean, if you are going to do it right, you hopefully are respecting values that are enshrined in, in Islam that, uh, that respect uh, the environment, that respect society, respects other people, that respects um, uh, you know, I mean, and governance, of course, is, is something different, but it has to, it, it also still has some implications, uh, especially as it relates to um, disclosure and being open and uh, providing information and be honest. Thank you. So, I don't know, Mahmoud, did you want to go? 
Yeah, I know, very quickly, from the early days of um, the inception um, and the creation of the SDGs, um, uh, there was some good realization of the potential of long-term um, finance, including through uh, Islamic finance, uh, SHUK. And um, back uh, in 2015, uh, I um, uh, authored a piece with colleagues at the World Bank and a professor at uh, at Durham University in the UK, um, um, and uh, I was just searching for it um, here. It's uh, called on sustainable development goals and the role of Islamic finance. And almost half of it is basically about the role of the spook and Islamic finance um, in this area. And more recently, we did a piece on public-private partnerships in sub-Saharan Africa and the role of green sukuk. So we got into more specific linking PPPs to uh, low income, middle income countries in Africa in the areas of infrastructure, PPP, financing them by green uh, sukuk based on some good evidence from, um, from the field. Here is a way to go, to go into innovation. My only issue with that, and I said it in the presence of the two uh, um, uh, presidents of the Islamic Development Bank, the current president and the former President, the legendary Dr. Ali, um, um, the former president of the Islamic uh, Development Bank, that what we need, innovate, link finance to uh, real economy and the social returns, but please make as much as we can. These projects need to be simple to understand. We don't need really to go into very complicated SPV structure. There should be an SPV somewhere, but we don't need really to make it complicated for people not to understand it. For some of the, your previous participants talked about how can we understand these things? How can we make sure that there is no washing of the claims or SDG or ESG or, or, uh, or green that or, or, or blue this? So I think simple structure, fully transparent, standardization is key, disclosure based on international standard and make it accessible to all for knowledge sharing and for application but the potential is there and there are already some good examples in the field. And um, I think uh, Mr. Iglesia can give some, some examples uh, at some stage about how the, the, the green bonds, the conventional ones have many brothers and sisters of variety of sukuk and other forms as well um, of, um, of issuance. Thank you. One question from Fatima Zohra Rahmoun, uh, maybe for Haume. Do you think that COVID-19 will quicken the pace of ESG investment, reshape the investment landscape? And uh, some investors have been asking companies to prioritize worker health and safety, among other things. How can PPP project implement as ESG investment and place more emphasis on social issues? And the third part of that question is, what are the legal framework and challenges facing the ESG impacts of PPPs? So I, maybe if you can answer the two first aspects, uh, how may that would be excellent. Yeah, regarding the social and then regarding the, the interest, whether the current situation will stop ESG or will, to the contrary, just be a boost. So I, I think there's this, there's this um, concern of people saying, well, the priorities from governments now they're moving and they have so much on their plate that ESG will become kind of a luxury. Uh, that's one of the concerns. Uh, what we're seeing, though, is that I'm just talking about the private side, uh, is that the interest of, for ESG has never been bigger than now. And the interest from investors just skyrocketed since February 21st, which was the date when markets crashed. So if you compare the assets going into conventional um, bonds, for example, or equities, they, they just went down to the gutter and anything that had the ESG touch just uh, went up. Not, not only in terms of performance, but just in terms of money being deployed. So it seems that there's this recognition that the ESG factors help to mitigate part of the risk companies are facing. So I believe that this is here to stay. Well, I have no doubt because none of the challenges that we face like climate change or social inequality, like gender inequality, seem unfortunately, unfortunately to fade away in the next few years. So, um, so there's enough reasons to believe that sustainable investment will still play a role. Then when it comes to uh, the second question in terms of social, uh, 
well, I, I think that the only thing that I can say is that, uh, and again, from my little corner of the world, I mean, looking at uh, private investments is that if you look at which are the most successful companies today, uh, probably they're nothing but a bunch of employees. If you look at the Facebooks, and I'm not saying that they are sustainable companies, just saying that the Facebook, the Amazons, the, the Netflix, the, the Googles, uh, the Microsofts, probably 95% of the value of that company is just employees, if not more than that, right? So if 95% of the value of a company's employees, shouldn't you give uh, social aspects the most important role when you try to understand the future chances of that company being successful? And that does apply, applies not only to IT companies, but there's a number of sectors, uh, not only in high skilled workers, but restaurants, tourism, um, anything that relates to client interaction, then social plays a very big role. Super. Uh, then the third aspect I would like to give to Professor Raymond Zana, what are the legal framework and challenges facing the ESG impacts in PPPs? Your mic, your microphone, Raymond. Mike, Raymond, your microphone it needs to be unmuted, please. I just wanted to say, uh, I'd like to stay with the second one and, okay. and let Zia take care of the third one, if he doesn't mind. <laughs> the, uh, the second one, uh, to build on Raume, one thing we haven't mentioned, or maybe it was mentioned briefly uh, by, by Dr. Mahmoudin, the SDGs are basically three dimensions. Sustainable uh, environment, sustainable society, social, and sustainable economy. So the ESG to me are either deliberately exchanging G for E, or it's just gotten forgotten. As much as we have forgotten in a way to inc help ways companies to more better emphasize the S in their investment. I think the E of SDGs are nowhere. And I just have a, a, a suggestion, maybe how may that's possible to do, to create maybe a new, let's say a bucket of, of investors who agree to limit their return on investment to say 4%. <clears throat> and instead, Invest, <clears throat> invest in alternative economic development. That could be cooperatives. It could be social uh, uh, development uh, related institutions. But other than what we have mostly still, private sector, public sector, and the rest. So for, for me, for two, it's the, the economic sustainability is missing. And it would be great to have a new um, sort of, you know, uh, in, uh, investment index for those investors who agree to just stick with a, a minimum amount of return on investment and say it publicly and then get a grade based on that, that they also uh, in, put their money into something other than quick return on investment. So yeah. Actually, I have to say, since uh, JC said this was the question going to you, I didn't pay attention to it. So, so, so the question, <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat, it's yeah. what are the legal framework and challenges facing the ESG impacts in PPPs? From the Fatima Zora. The challenges facing ESG impact on, P on PPPs. What are the legal framework and challenges facing the ESG impacts in PPPs? Well, I mean, uh, the, in the legal framework, because many, many countries, what they have in their PPP laws is, is more, it's drafted based on procurement laws. Um, there are no stipulations that the ES and certainly G factors should be, should be respected when, when projects are being designed and tendered. Um, 
and and this is this is something that uh, of course needs to be uh, rectified i don't know countries today that are working very diligently on this maybe you know there are some regulations that are ad added outside the ppp laws to get these things done but uh, but i think a major overhaul of ppp and procurement laws ought to take place in that regard thank you very much We'll take one more question and then we'll have to wrap up because I have to be mindful with everybody's time. Uh, Marco Angelo would like to know the existence of an excess reserve in depository institutions may be read as uneven distribution of wealth. Shouldn't we push for more wealth redistribution through progressive taxation and public spending instead of waiting for investors to contribute to sustainable development through PPPs? Of course, private investment is important, but in sectors such as health and education, public investment has proven to be key to reach affordable universal access to education and health care. Yes, please, Dr. Mahmoud. Yeah, the, the, this question takes us beyond um, the specific uh, micro focus on PPP projects to the overall um, economic uh, fiscal management and public uh, policies, including in their areas for uh, social protection and investment in human capital. What we are trying to say here, and there are some good examples, for any country, and I might be exaggerating the importance, but for any country, and I might be as well oversimplifying, the most important document after the constitution is the budget of the state. It provides the priorities, it provides signals. It's not just a funding mechanism. It is not just the importance of the budget for macroeconomic perspective that you don't need to exceed budget deficit at uh, some extent or to have some sort of rules um, of um, revenue mobilization to spend. It's basically signaling priorities of the community, the people and, and the state. Here, this is your way of dealing with these questions about, about inclusion, about inequality, about investment in opportunities in education and health. It's basically, what, what could be the solution there in short? It perhaps is to have an SDG budget uh, design. There are some countries, including actually Spain, that has a good design for an SDG-based budget. Um, how to end poverty, how to make matters more equal, how to spend on, on human capital, on, on climate, all of that is in the budget. Not, not to have the budget and then translate it into the SDG um, uh, language. A any kind of a good high school um, uh, student can really do that. See the budget and then each item, they can give you the SDG color attached to it, as we used to do in the old days when it comes to the MDGs. Now you, you need to do it differently from the local budget in the municipalities to the national budget, you need to design it based on the SDGs. If you do that, these kinds of surpluses here as mentioned and deficit there should be bridged through the fiscal transparent way, not in a kind of, uh, um, of punishing, but in a kind of, a, of an inclusive way to get matters done. You need, for instance, universal, universal basic income and um, social protection schemes. How are you going to do it? Taxing, including taxing uh, taxes on wealth. There are some uh, surpluses and some um, um, uh, entities. You, you may need, as mentioned earlier, you need to incentivize them to uh, go from the bads to the goods to the idle uh, ways of using the money to where they are really needed. Even after all of these crises, the global system is a wash of abundance when it comes to finances. Many of them today of, of, of funds are put in negative yield around the world. You pay to get your money invested, not the other way around. So the opportunities are there, but people need really to have the investment, the return, the risk fully designed and put that in that kind of framework. It needs better coordination mechanism, not just for the PPP good managers and their financiers, but basically at, at the national level uh, when you are designing these budgets. Thank yeah, you just very add, much. Yeah, just add one word, uh, fully agree with uh, Dr. Mahmoud. 
uh, very important what he is saying. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, all of us need to be pushing our decision makers in government to think about in this way. Actually, um, SDG number 17 is about partnerships and it is the one SDG that is talking about how to achieve the other SDGs. So you have 16 SDGs that are related to the issues that the person that asked this question is, is concerned with, mainly having to do with the well-being of people. And PPP should be regarded as an instrument uh, to help deliver on that. It should not be the only instrument, but an important one. On this final word, I would like to uh, thank everybody who attended. We're very proud so many people took time to follow our webinar in association with Infra, PPP World, and DAKE. Many thanks to our many interesting questions and to the speakers. We're planning an op-ed, a sort of a solution paper on the conversation we had today, and we will provide the video of the webinar shortly. We're always grateful for your feedback on what we did well and also what could be improved. We have recently relaunched the website wap.org. We invite you to go visit it and we would be very happy to onboard you uh, in our WAP family uh, of PPP professionals and with PPP units, PPP professionals, corporate members, or simply as a PPP enthusiast. Please follow WAP on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you very much for having been with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.